May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Our text today is the second reading from 1 Peter chapter 3. Read again verses 15 through 18. But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. My dear family in Christ, it can be really frustrating when someone doesn't finish a job they're supposed to do, when a painter doesn't, doesn't finish painting your house, when an electrician doesn't finish wiring your home, when a mechanic doesn't finish fixing your car. They may make a good start, but they never do all that they promise to do. They leave some of the work unfinished, you've got to get them to come back again, or get someone else to come and finish the job properly. On the other hand, it's great when the job is done right the first time. When someone keeps their promises and does everything that they said they would do, we really appreciate it when someone completes their task, when they leave nothing undone. We express our thanks and our gratitude for a job well done. So how did Jesus do when he came to this earth? Did he do everything he was supposed to do? Did he successfully complete his mission? Did he finish the work that he came to do? These are all important questions, and their answers have eternal consequences. These verses before us today will help us evaluate what Jesus did and how successful he was at completing his saving work. Peter begins this section by reminding us that we are to be gentle and respectful when we share our faith with others. Our behavior must be above reproach. People should be ashamed if they slander us. And if we suffer at the hands of others, it should be for doing good, not for doing evil. As Peter here talks about Christians suffering, he remembers how Jesus suffered for us on the cross. As he talks about how Christians were being persecuted, he remembers how Jesus was persecuted, how he was put to death on the cross. Jesus had warned his disciples that if people persecuted him, they would persecute them as well. He told them, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. Peter then summarizes what Jesus did to save us. All these things that Peter's going to mention here are things that we should believe in, that we should trust in for our salvation. He's going to summarize the gospel. He's going to give us the gospel in a nutshell. And so he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Peter here talks about Jesus' suffering. It wasn't easy for Jesus to save us from our sins. It cost him his life. He had to suffer and die for us. And his suffering was both physical and spiritual. As if the physical suffering of being crucified wasn't bad enough, he also had to endure the pain and agony of hell for us. There on the cross he was forsaken by God, as our sins that were placed on him separated him from his heavenly Father. And there on the cross Jesus did everything that was necessary to save us. One of the last things Jesus said from the cross was, It is finished. He meant that his saving work was complete, that he had done everything he was supposed to do. He was like a painter who finishes painting your house, like a mechanic who finishes fixing your car, like an electrician who finishes wiring your home. Jesus didn't leave anything undone. He finished the job. And Peter makes a point here that Jesus suffered and died once for us. He did it right the first time. Didn't have to repeat it. Didn't have to keep doing it over and over again. As the writer to the Hebrews tells us about Jesus, unlike the other high priests, 
He does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. As the holy, perfect sacrifice for sin once was enough. So Jesus did everything to pay for the sins of the world. Peter says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. By his suffering and death, Jesus dealt with all the sins of all people of all time. By his suffering and death, he dealt with your sins and my sins. The holy, perfect Son of God suffered and died for sinners like us. And so Peter says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. As our substitute, Jesus took our place. He took upon himself all the punishment of our sins that we deserved. Jesus successfully completed his saving work to reconcile us to God. So Peter continues, he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus really was put to death. He wasn't just in a coma. He wasn't just unconscious when he was placed in the tomb. He was really, truly dead. But then he really, truly came to life again. On Easter morning, he rose victorious from the grave. His resurrection was God's stamp of approval on all of Jesus' saving work. He had successfully completed all that he had to do to save the world from sin. Now, what was the first thing that Jesus did then after coming alive again? The first thing he did was to descend to hell, to proclaim his victory over Satan and the forces of evil. Peter explains, after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Early Easter morning, before he showed himself alive to the women and to the disciples, he went to hell, not to suffer, but to proclaim his victory, to announce that his saving work was complete, that he'd saved the world from sin, death, and the devil's power. And who was already there in hell? Peter specifically mentions the unbelievers from the time of Noah. At the moment of death, a person's soul goes to where it's going, either heaven or hell. So the souls of these Old Testament unbelievers were already there in hell with the devil and his evil angels when Jesus went there to proclaim his victory. Speaking of Noah's ark, Peter says, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. We usually don't think of the waters of the flood as saving Noah and his family, but that's exactly what Peter says here. While those flood waters certainly destroyed everyone who was outside the ark, those same waters lifted the ark and the eight people in it high above the destruction and death below. Peter then goes on a little detour to talk about baptism. Speaking of the waters of the flood, he continues, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Just as the waters of the flood saved Noah and his family physically, so the water of baptism saves a person spiritually. A lot of churches go to great lengths to try and explain how baptism doesn't save. But that's exactly what Peter says here. And what Peter says is what Peter means, baptism saves. The only question is, how does baptism save people? Peter states the obvious here when he said that baptism doesn't cleanse people from physical dirt. Physical dirt. He's not talking about physical cleansing, but a spiritual cleansing. And so he says that baptism is the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. Baptism is a means of grace. It's something that God uses to bring his grace and the forgiveness of sins to the person who's being baptized, even to little children. And if our sins have been forgiven, then we have a clear conscience before God. Peter isn't saying that baptism is some kind of magic water that somehow forgives a person their sins. Peter says baptism saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Salvation is always and only through Jesus. Baptism is a wonderful way of applying Jesus' saving work to the person being baptized. 
as Paul reminded the Galatians. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. When we were baptized, we were clothed with the risen Lord and his completed work of salvation. That's how baptism saves us. To finish his argument that Jesus has, had completed everything he came to do, Peter says that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. There's no way that Jesus could have returned to heaven if he hadn't completed his saving work. His ascension to heaven, which the church will celebrate this coming Thursday, is proof that Jesus finished his job. He did everything he was supposed to do to save the world. He left nothing undone. And so he did all that he had to do to save the world from sin. And then he returned home, went back to heaven. Now he's in heaven, ruling and reigning over all things for the good of the church and its people. These verses that Peter gives us here are a wonderful summary of the gospel. The good news of salvation through Jesus. He's listed some of the most important things that we need to believe, that we need to trust in to be saved. Everything from how Jesus suffered and died on the cross to how he is now reigning in heaven for the good of all believers. He's reminded us of baptism by which the saving work of Jesus becomes our very own. This is the good news that we need to believe. This is better than a promotion at work. This is better than being cured from cancer. This is better than the coronavirus coming to an end. This is the good news of Jesus that we must believe to be saved. Peter sums it all up in the opening sentence to this section when he says, In your hearts revere Christ as Lord. This then is the good news that we are to share with others. So many people here in our neighborhood and around the world do not revere Christ as Lord. They don't believe all these things about Jesus that Peter has reminded us of here. They don't believe in Jesus and his suffering and death. They don't believe in his rising from the dead and his ascension back to heaven. You and I have the best news ever. We know these things about Jesus that Peter has reminded us of. We know how Jesus suffered and died once for our sins. We know how he successfully completed all his saving work. We know the things that people here and around the world need to believe in order to be saved. So let's not keep the good news of Jesus to ourselves. Let's share the good news of Jesus with everyone we can. Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Peter says, be prepared to share your faith. Be prepared to share the good news of Jesus. Be ready. Think through what you might say to someone. Remember the main points of our faith that Peter has here reminded us of. Think of the things that Peter has listed. Use them as an outline to what you may say as you share your faith with another person. Especially if another person asks you about your faith, be ready to tell them what you believe. Especially if someone asks you, what is this hope that you have of going to heaven? Be ready to tell them. Peter encourages us, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. So many people hope to get to heaven by themselves, by their own goodness. Be ready to tell people the real reason we have the hope of getting to heaven, through Jesus and what he suffered once for us on the cross. But Peter here cautions us about how we should do this. He cautions us against just charging ahead and talking about our faith without thinking about how our words might sound to another person. Peter advises do this with gentleness and respect, with a clear conscience. We must be careful that we're not more concerned about getting through our presentation than we are about the other person and where they're at. Peter here encourages us to witness gently. There's no point in raising our voices, shouting at the other person. Talk gently. 
And Peter encourages us to treat other people with respect. Don't belittle them. Don't make them feel foolish. Peter urges us to keep a clear conscience as we share our faith with others. Don't say or do anything that you may later regret, that you may later feel guilty about. Do everything in a God-pleasing way. Make sure that you share how Jesus did everything necessary to save us. Emphasize how Jesus suffered and died for us once, the righteous for the unrighteous. Explain how he got it right the first time, how he had to do it only once. Believe this for yourself and then share it with others. Amen. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, now and forever. Amen. We pray, Lord of heaven and earth, we pray that the, the coronavirus pandemic will soon be over. May the day come soon and we can gather again in your house and worship you together with our fellow believers. According to your gracious will, slow the number of new cases and allow those who are sick to recover. Protect us and our loved ones and bring us safely through this trying time. Lord of the Church, we also thank you that you've blessed us with the assignment of a graduate from Martin Luther College, our own member, Ariana Sanchez, to teach grade seven in our school. Bless her work among us as she brings your word to the children in her class. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Just a reminder that I have English group uh, communions of uh, nine people or less on Mondays at 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Let me know if you'd like to participate in that. May God go with you, keep you safe.